Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Parcel Cast. Today we're going to be going through episode three and discussing capacity, cost, control, and customer experience with Pitney Bowes. I'm Bill Schrader, Vice President of Research and Development here at ProShip. And with me, I have Rick Hernandez, Commercial Innovation Leader and the Vice President of Global Business Development for Pitney Bowes. Rick, thanks for joining us. And today, uh, we have a lot of very interesting things that uh, have unfolded in a very interesting year. And I think uh, your idea of approaching it from a capacity cost control and the customer experience standpoint really hits on some of the highlights and, and what our customers are going through in, in trying to navigate the, uh, an entirely unprecedented set of challenges. So uh, Rick, glad to have you here. Thanks, Bill. I really appreciate it. And uh, happy peak shipping season. And thanks for inviting me to sit down with you. Uh, I'd like to spend some time talking about the four C's, as we call it. But uh, I think that if we step back and look at 2020, it's definitely been a crazy year, a horrible year in many respects. But from an e-commerce perspective, it's like a spaghetti western. In some strange way, the outcome is good. But if you looked at it from the perspective of conventional wisdom, what we've looked at for the last 10 years, it doesn't make any sense. And you know, if you step back to 2018 and 2019 and you think about what were the big trends that were happening, you know, I went and looked at some of the presentations I put together then, and I can tell you like that walk down memory lane, what were we talking about back then? Well, we were talking about faster. We were talking about freer. Amazon was the driver in the US and Alibaba and uh, Amazon were also pushing people around the globe to speed things up, make the cost of shipping freer. And, you know, it was those are the boogeymen that were chasing us. You know, we had the next day, the same day, three day from China. These were things that we were all worried about. We we're all trying to figure out how do we get in front of this? And, you know, as it turns out, when we hit the tipping point with COVID and all this e-commerce volume came flooding in, the model we've been working on before demonstrated itself to be unsustainable. You know, we really couldn't bigger and better and faster and freer everything. It was, it just wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that was sustainable because there is limited capacity in the market. And I think that's one of the big things that um, we've seen is, you know, when you look at 2020 and you compare it to how we started the year, you know, e-commerce is actually growing a little bit slower than it had the previous years. If you look at e-marketer and uh, where they were positioning 2020 at, they were saying, well, it looks like 16% growth is what we're going to see, which is great. It's great to be in any industry that's growing. But the previous years, we'd seen 20% plus growth for, for many of those years. So it looked like the, the velocity was uh, slowing down just a little bit. And then, you know, we saw what happened in March and April timeframe. You know, we've seen 35 to 40 percent growth in e-commerce across the board. The big companies like Amazon, the big retailers who, you know, they've moved their volume from traditional stores to a new way to reach customers. And what we've done is we've we've really hit a wall, you know, with marketplaces and big customers growing 100 percent, 200 percent, 300 percent, you know there really wasn't enough capacity to move packages. And when we saw the, um, you know, the, the downturn in uh, air travel, passenger air travel, that had a carry on effect, both domestically and internationally, because a lot of packages were moving in the belly of those planes. And so now you have the traditional relationships that you know, we've built up as an industry, that they've all been thrown out the window. And the carriers looked at it and said, well, we have limited capacity. We're not going to spend billions of dollars to add new capacity and add new infrastructure to the market. So we're going to have to change the way things work. So, you know, if you look at FedEx and UPS in particular, um, they've introduced caps. They introduced tiered pricing. And in many cases, they've, they've basically fired customers or virtually fired them with these COVID and peak surcharges that they've added to the mix. So if you started 2020 with a plan 
like many of us, that plan got thrown out the window. So it's been um, it's been a rough year for many people. And, you know, you've seen the headlines of trailers of packages being left in the parking lots of major brands, big retail customers. It's been a real struggle and everybody, everybody has been scrambling to figure out new ways to, uh, you know, get packages to deliver to customers or think about new strategies in terms of how they're going to manage all that volume. In the case of the private carriers, because they're not investing that capital to expand their delivery networks to handle the volume, they've effectively been um, managing the margin, right? They've been, you know, building a very profitable business and they've decided to turn stuff away because they could. I was talking to, um, sorry, Bill, what was that? Uh, Rick, I didn't say anything, but uh, this is a fascinating topic. So uh, with the carriers in particular, um, if you looked at the trend lines you mentioned in 2018, 2019, it was an upward trend that was predictable and the networks and the big carriers were building capacity that that matched the forecast for that and as you've been mentioning um you know that they, they had to shift they had to pivot everybody had to adjust and the only lever that they had to pull like you noted is the surcharges and and actually turning some volume away, firing some less profitable customers, which of course is detrimental to retail businesses that are already suffering. Um, but uh, how does how does Pitney deal with the capacity thing? It, it seems like there's a, a lot of flexibility in your network that they don't share. Well, uh, I think there's a couple of things we've done. Um, you know, I don't think many people know this, but uh, you know, Pitney Bowes in itself uses a lot of third-party carriers. Um, uh, we spend about $250 million a year domestically and internationally with carriers. And so if you look at our international business, we were sent scrambling, right? Our, our transportation team, our procurement team, they were working the phones day and night for the first 30 days of uh, COVID with all the disruptions to air travel and to air cargo capacity internationally. And domestically, it's been, um, it's been interesting because most of our domestic business moves through the US Postal Service. And so part of what we do is, you know, we have a digital business where we enable customers to you know, generate a priority mail shipping label and they hand it off to the post office directly. And the post office has proved pretty resilient in handling the volume. They had some bumps in the July timeframe in terms of the volume, but they've managed to get ahead of that curve. And when they work with companies like us, what we do is um, we take advantage of the US Postal Service network where it's strongest, which is in the last mile delivery. And if you, exactly. Um, exactly. that's right. And, and so if you look at what we do, right, is um, we have a pretty good cost model, you know, where we can control our trucks, where we you know, use third parties to move things in that middle mile, that first mile, you know, we've got a lower cost, but where the post office has an advantage is in that last mile delivery point. If, um, if like me, like this week, you know, we're all hands on deck. So we have people working in parcel sortation facilities, you know, executives are all pitching in, helping out wherever they can. In my case, um, they uh, gave me a van and had me driving around central Valley, California, uh, picking up packages from our Stockton facility and taking it to DDUs, like the individual post offices that are the destination delivery units, the ones that are responsible for getting those packages to your house. And when you look in those facilities, the surprising thing is they've got a lot of capacity, right? I mean, they're certainly busy. You know, I pull up with my five sacks of parcels and I'm dropping them off and I feel like I'm carrying a load. And then you see a 53 foot truck roll in filled with parcels and those facilities are handling it. They're, they've got, the, the staff aren't stressed at the post offices. They're not stressed, they're handling them, they're, they're getting them sorted and they're getting them delivered to customers. And you know, what's interesting is Amazon really helped the postal service build out their capacity. And what's happened is a lot of that volume, Amazon has taken it back and they're delivering it themselves. So when you work with the Postal Service, 
they have plenty of capacity if you can get the package to them at the destination delivery unit. And that's where we've been spending a lot of our investment, a lot of our effort is figuring out how can we do more of that work share? How can we pick up the load? It's um, it, it's one of the things we've done. And it's certainly, you know, we've had our challenges uh, uh, like anybody. Uh, looking at our facility, you're like, wow, um, how did our sales rep take on those types of packages? We're not supposed to be delivering Christmas trees, right? Everybody has those kinds of things. And I think that's one of the things that hats off to UPS and FedEx for really thinking about their networks carefully and saying, huh, what's the kind of volume that I wanna be able to bring into my network? Not just because it's profitable, but because I can meet the SLAs that people have. I can meet the expectations that customers have and nobody wants to be in the headlines again uh, you know, when a big customer says, hey, you didn't deliver my packages on time. So everybody's doing their own part to, you know, take, take advantage of where they're strong. In our case, we've been improving our middle mile and first mile services so that we can pick up more efficiently from customers. We can sort those packages so you don't have to touch them as much and then hand them off to the post office. Because once you give it to that DDU, they just they're, they're a machine, right? It's one of the things they do really well is they take those packages in and they make sure they get delivered to customers in a really efficient manner. So that's uh, it, fascinating stuff and, and we're seeing it and I, it, you kind of made me think of a couple questions and, and one's gonna use a double meaning for the word customer. So when, when you and I talk about customers, there's both our customer who's the shipper and then there's the end customer, right? Um, and I, I know Pitney pays a lot of attention to the, the behavior of the customers and, and does surveys and the like about what their delivery expectations are. And I'm sure we'll get into some of that in the customer experience section. But around the, the customer behaviors, both the shippers and the end customers, are, are you seeing changing consumer behaviors? Are you seeing changing shipper behaviors? Um, how are they dealing with the capacity constraints? Well, I think Amazon did everybody a favor. If you remember in sort of uh, April timeframe, when they just told everybody, look, we're gonna change your, we're gonna change the delivery timeframe on products. Essential goods are gonna move faster. Everything else is going to go a little slower. And in some ways that, that, changed the expectations for the market because Amazon is the market leader in the US and it gave everybody a little bit of breathing room from that unsustainable faster and freer model that we'd all been working towards. So I think that was a really important thing that, that shifted the dynamic. And I, I think now when we, we do, um, as Pitney Bowes, we do surveys of customers. So we did, um, uh, Prior to COVID, we did a consumer survey to gauge their expectations around delivery. And then post COVID, um, we, we also did a follow-up survey asking a lot of the same questions around delivery expectations. And what's interesting is that customers, you know, we're all working from home now. Ironically, um, customers' expectations around what fast delivery is shifted. And we see that in the data. Right, customers are saying, hey, you know what? It can take a couple extra days to get here. And I still think it's fast. So it takes one to two days longer and customers still think it's fast. That was one of the interesting things that happened. So with, with that shift, as long as you can set the expectation with the customer on when it's going to arrive, I think customers really are comfortable with, okay, it's gonna take a little bit longer, but uh, they're not stressing out about it as much. And that, that is one of the surprising things I've seen in this environment is both the marketplace dynamic has shifted and then consumers expectations around what's considered fast has shifted it's also interesting what's considered an acceptable delivery window you know like customers had like a, a five to seven day delivery window you know in 2019 the end of 2019 when we did the survey that was the time frame where they felt comfortable and now it's shifted to like you know eight nine days that's perfectly fine as long as you tell me that's how long it's going to take. As long as I'm not getting an expectation it's going to be here tomorrow and it takes two weeks. So I think both of those things have really shifted in the market. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Uh, I know from my own personal experience, shortly after the pandemic, I was very tolerant. I gave up on my, you know, my addiction to the two-day delivery stuff, and I, I was willing to put up with a week. And you know, it, we're all just kind of wandering around the world that that first few weeks, trying to find toilet paper. <laughs> um, it, it's gotten it's gotten a lot easier, and and in some cases the I imagine the delivery expectations of the customers have have shifted, and some of it is returned to you know I, I'm not going to wait a week for stuff, but you know two three days that's just fine. It's easier than going to the store, um, and I may not even be allowed to go to the store depending on where I live, so that. All of that is is feeding into a whole different set of of customer expectations around delivery, um, and the challenges that customers are facing with with cost and capacity that that are driving it. There also has to be you know controls around it, um, and and then we'll get into customer experience, right? But in the control section, one of the things that I've observed is. Uh, First of all, everybody gave up the money back guarantees, right? Nobody offers them at all anymore. Um, I think perhaps Pitney's different in that area, but there's also a lot of controls around still getting it delivered, getting it tracked within a time frame that you kind of promise the customer you're going to get it there. And one of the things that that is still very dependable with UPS and FedEx is you'll get in most cases, the service level that you purchased without the guarantee, um, if they face factors that are out of their control. But the surprising thing, I think, with the, the USPS, especially the way that, that Pitney has integrated them for Final Mile and with what you do, is you still have a very predictable delivery model. You, you still have a very tight, um, set of expectations and service level commitments that are being met. Um, is that is that something that you're seeing your your shipper customers leverage in order to maintain control and and kind of a good positive experience? Absolutely. I mean, I think you know if I look at merchants or retailers, um, the shippers, <clears throat> what they've done is. They've really scrambled, they've had to scramble to find who has the capacity to handle this volume, but also do it cost effectively. You know, when we look at um, the impact from a pricing perspective, you know, there are a lot of people who are struggling right now as a business because they are using one of those two private carriers and for the bulk of their shipments, and the cost just went through the roof. Um, things got really super expensive and um you know the cfo is pushing on them you need to get the cost down and you need to control the business more effectively you need to be able to provide a predictable experience for our customers and you need to be able to manage the network right you have to set the expectation and then have carriers who can deliver it i know that we started the year um you know our transportation team was given a target of hey, look, we need you to cut your cost 10%. We need to cut the long tail by half a day. And you need to, uh, sorry, cut the delivery time by half a day and cut the tail in half. So, you know, when you get those residual packages, it just seemed to take a lot longer to get delivered to customers for whatever reasons. We needed to cut those out of our network. That was the, the plan we had for control. And, you know, everybody's plan has shifted, as has ours. You know, we just wanted to make sure that we're able to help those customers get packages delivered. And I'll tell you what, you know, those those customers who move from UPS ground to a priority mail product, one, it's definitely cheaper. Uh, two, though, the service standard is keeping up with the UPS and FedEx perspective. So it's been, you know, there's there's always exceptions, there's always challenges in this business, but I think that, you know, the the customers who've shifted to a postal model most of them have been pretty happy and you know it's really about managing the mix of your products right if you try to move to postal and you're sending microwave ovens and uh, christmas trees you know what ups or fedex are going to be better at that if you're sending you know what 80 percent of e-commerce has traditionally been 
uh, stuff that's under two pounds, stuff that's, uh, you know, not huge and bulky. Uh, you know, Postal is a great option and customers have been pretty happy with, with what they're doing. One of, one of my biggest customers who I work with, um, you know, they've seen over 160% growth year over year. And, and these, these are folks who move millions of parcels a day sometimes. And, you know, th there's always challenges when you work with, when you're that big and you work with somebody like the post office, but the consumer expectations are really met, right? And then you can see that their customers, their consumers are, you know, continuing to spend with, with those guys. So I, I think it's, um, I think it's been pretty good. You know, there's always some hiccups in a year like this, but it definitely been a really good experience for the vast majority of our customers. Yeah, I I think for for a decade or so, um, and, and Amazon has really changed this. But there was a customer expectation that was part of the branding of the delivery mechanism. So a lot of e-commerce uh, companies that were on the higher end and wanted to present a better image might might pick FedEx for the brand association reasons. Uh, you know, business to business stuff, brown trucks were just fine. Um, what I think has happened and what I've seen now is, is a shift in the way companies are handling uh, their entire transportation mix and really a, a complete apathy on the customer side in terms of who delivered their package. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be necessarily the level of concern around that as much as there used to be. Um, fascinating times we live in, fascinating times. Uh, let, let's, let's wrap up with a couple of ideas. Um, I've noticed with our customers, our big shippers, that uh, they used to modify and tweak their strategic carrier mix and, and optimize their strategy, renegotiate contracts every few years, and then they kind of stick with it and and over the last decade or so there there's been more multi-carrier interest uh, they've picked up a few regionals um, today we have customers that manage and and execute their strategy by leveraging a dozen carriers now that's that's on the upper end that it, it's rough to manage that but in some cases it's the only way to execute effectively um, and manage their costs. There's just so much to this, and you know we're only we're only at the very beginning of figuring out what the new normal is. Um, we have a whole set of of data points, and and we've been sharing some of that conversation with you. Uh, our customers, as they went into this, they pivoted. They tried to adjust to a number of different things. Uh, they tried to prepare. A strategic plan that that would get them successfully through peak. Uh, some of it's working, some of it not quite as much. We have a, a series of webinars planned with uh, a number of different partners and such in the in the new year where we're going to dive into what did work and what didn't work, um, what planning for peak 2021 is looking like. I was wondering if there's any advice you can offer us uh, this early in the game, strategically, what should customers be looking to do? Um, what can we do collaboratively together to, to help them succeed? Uh, final thoughts, Rick, what do you got? Well, I, I think the thing to think about and the conversation to have with your CFO or the president of your business, if you're a merchant or a retailer or any kind of big shipper, is we're in an era of dynamic pricing. We don't know what our prices and what our costs are going to be. So you really need to look at the carrier mix in a different way. You need to look at your primaries, you need to look at your backups. You need to bring in some of these, you know, third parties, you know, people who talk to a lot of customers. Uh, I was talking to Nate Skyver the other day and and he he sees that uh, he's LPF uh, consulting. Um, he helps, you know, small shippers and some large shippers think about these things in a different way. And, you know, you, you just got to expect that 
you don't know what your price is going to be. So make sure you've got a backup plan as you think about these things. And you also, um, you know, I think, think about what can you do to take more control of your business, right? Is it, do you need to regionalize your volume a little bit more? If you look at what Amazon has done really successfully is while everybody else's annual transportation costs have been growing between five and 10% year over year, until 2020, Amazon was able to get its cost, its delivery costs down to that about $2 per parcel to deliver something to the customer, which is astonishing when you think about that. And so, you know, part of it is they've, you know, built their own delivery fleet. They've come up with uh, ways of organizing their business so that they can cost effectively, you know, put those Sprinter vans in, in our neighborhoods and deliver packages to us. But, you know, just because you're, you're Amazon doesn't mean, you know, you have to go you know, duplicate what they're doing and get your own Sprinter vans, but you do need to think about these things a little more creatively. Think about your mix. And I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to bring in outside experts you know, and, and, you know, talk to folks and get their thoughts, talk to your peers in the industry, uh, because everybody is looking at this from a different perspective. And, you know, at the end of the day, as, you know, people in the shipping business, we really are trying to manage consumer expectations, right? We want to make sure that we're getting the package to the customer. They're having a great experience and, um, you know, just make sure you've got a backup plan as you go through that analysis. I think that that's important. Get that help, have a plan, have a backup plan for each of your carriers. Yeah, that's a that's a great set of points and that that matches the trends we've been seeing uh, you know, very few companies have the luxury of just in a matter of years standing up their own delivery network. Uh, well, actually there's probably only one. And and what I'm seeing a lot of our customers do is, is kind of like build their own virtual uh, carrier network combination of a basket of options and choices uh, executed regionally in, in a manner that matches their distribution center footprint. Uh, ship from store is huge. I mean, I, we, we could do an entire podcast on just <laughs> ship from store and the number of different ways that people are slicing and dicing and using that and, and rethinking their brick and mortar retail space. And I, I'm sure 2021 is going to be a year where uh, we see a great deal of innovation on, you know, what does a brick and mortar store really do? And what are our expectations for, you know, micro DCs out of their stores and a number of different things coming up. Uh, one of the things that, that we deal with in particular at ProShip, and it's it's really kind of been the saving grace for many of our customers, is dynamically letting them be able to control the flow of packages to various carriers, adjust to the surcharges, the, the dynamic pricing that you're referring to, um, and managing their volumes that are, are executed to the particular carriers. The world used to be a very complicated simplicity um, with with different carriers and, and a couple different package parameters and, and things like that. Now there's so many other factors you have to put into the decision to actually flow that package through a particular network and and making that decision literally at the point where it's going through the print and apply tunnel or uh, the pack station, and uh, it, this is one of the areas where I, I think people are looking at new carriers, new options with a different perspective. That um, you know, I don't, I don't have to dedicate X amount of my parcels to a particular carrier anymore. I need to have a more fluid decision matrix. I, I have to have business rules that I can apply differently on different days. Um, and depending on the volume going through and the weight breaks of the packages and everything else. And, and I, think, uh, I think you guys can offer up some analysis on the, you know, the best packages that, that fit in your network most cost effectively. Um, and kind of, you know, I'm kind of interested in your thoughts around where's the sweet spot? Where do 
customers come and ask you to help them save money? Boy, customers ask us to save money everywhere, right? And the question is, you know, do you answer the question correctly <laughs> for our network? I mean, from from my perspective, when you when we're successful working with customers, it's typically going to be stuff that's in, you know, uh, less than a cubic foot for the majority of stuff. If eighty to ninety percent of your mix is under a cubic foot, that's a pretty good fit in our network. And if it's under twenty pounds, it's a good fit in our network. It's a really good fit in that, you know, one to five pound rate. One of the things about the, the, the postal service is that for, for under a pound, you know, almost everybody is still using the postal service for products that are under a pound. And UPS and FedEx have effectively priced those things out of their network, but you have companies like DHL e-commerce and ourselves who, you know, still you definitely use a lot of the postal services network to deliver those things but one of the things to think about with that mix is how much work are you willing to do as a retailer how much are you willing to do a sort how much are you willing to bag things how much of those packages are you willing to take to a carrier or take you know could you could take it to the post office but you can also take it to ups and the pricing model, this is, this is where the creativity really comes in. Um, uh, I work with um, a really large retail business, um, and they've got regionalized volume all over the country. And, you know, they're leveraging UPS's ground network by taking packages to them, and it's regionalized. So they get next day delivery, two day delivery. Um, with a ground network product, but they're paying ground network prices. They're not paying expedited prices, but they're willing to do a lot of that work themselves. And I think that's the question. If you're a CFO or if you want to go to your CFO is, is, is come to him with a plan of like, look, maybe we should hire a few more people to do some of this work for us. Maybe it makes sense for us to rent some vans or rent some trucks or, you know, bring an LTL in to do some of this stuff for us. I think those are important things for you to think about. The, the conventional thinking that we've used for the last 10 years, you know, it, it's really thrown out the window. So I would, I'd get creative and I would think about how much, how much work can you do to help get your costs down and then partner with your carriers. That, that's the people who do that with us are the ones who are really the most successful clients. The ones who ask us, hey, can I inject it into five locations? Can I inject it into seven locations? Can I inject it into 19 locations? You know, those are things that really help us as a carrier get your cost down is when you're willing to, you know, roll up your sleeves and work with us as a partner. And those are the kinds of customers I love working with. Yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Um, I, Rick, I tell you what, we're about out of time here. Uh, we'll be shortly. One of the things that I'd like to get a commitment from you on is uh, to to get together with us after after peaks over, give us a couple weeks and, and let the dust settle. Um, I have a set of of customers who've executed some creative, innovative ideas and and they're being successful. I have some that really came to the awareness too late and and now they're going to be going into uh, you know, into 2021 looking for answers. And we're hoping to provide a bunch of answers. So I, I'd love to collect some data from you, have you back on the show, talk through some of the things that worked, um, new new creative ideas we want to try to execute, make sure we're ready for 2021, which uh, will undoubtedly present a whole new set of challenges. So Rick, can I count on you for that? Absolutely. And we will be bringing our box poll data the next time I speak. Um, we're, we're interviewing shippers, we're interviewing consumers, and we've been doing weekly interviews. So we'll bring some data to the table and we'll talk about what actually happened in 2020 uh, based off of some of that survey data we've collected. And, and I'm already seeing some early uh, information from that coming in. So I think we're going to have some real lively stuff to talk about. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rick. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can come visit us at pitneybows.com slash US or proshipinc.com. Again, that's pitneybows.com.
proshipinc.com slash us or proshipinc.com. I uh, appreciate your time today. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email us at sales at proshipinc.com or give us a call, 800-353-7774. Again, that's 800-353-7774. Hope that the rest of the month ends well for you. Uh, hopefully, you'll have an opportunity to join us on our special bonus episode podcast which will be released in the celebration of the new year. So keep an eye out for that. Axelgistics is going to be joining us along with ProShip's co-founder, Justin Kramer. And I hope you'll make time uh, to listen in on them. And I'm looking forward to 2021, bringing us a whole new set of opportunities. Thank you and have a great day.